Let's stand together and sing the angel of him amazing grace. imprisonment 
gospels or epistles. Paul wrote this while he was awaiting trial. Mm -hmm. Ephesians is a letter that is to the church at Ephesus. Yeah. Ephesus was steeped uh, in Greek mythology. They had Greek mythological traditions as they worshipped the Greek goddess Armaeus. Uh, artists. They had even put a temple in her name where they would go in and they would worship Artemis. Uh -huh. She was known as the goddess of the hunt or wild animals or the wilderness or nature, vegetation, childbirth, the moon, and chastity. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, while Paul was in Ephesus, he was there preaching and teaching the gospel, and later on, within that chapter, something happened, and the Ephesians did not want to hear Paul nor his companions teach and preach about God and his salvation. So what happened, they began to scream out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They eventually cried the national religious chant for two hours because they did not want to hear from the Christians nor from the Jews. And today I submit to you, America is crying a national chant. They are crying a national chant of great is Satan, the prince of this world. Look, look around you. They are crying for a road versus way. They are crying about abortion. They are crying about homosexuality. They are crying about gun violence and gun reforms. But nobody wants to cry Jesus. In fact, if you cry out the name of Jesus, they will bleep it from the television. They will take you off of social media. They will take you off all these platforms. You see, there is no wonder why the church at Ephesus was full of false teachers and heresies. They were plagued with teachings about myths and endless genealogies, narcissism and skepticism, and sinless perfection. False teachers were also forbidding them to marry and abstaining from meat and other worldly, unscriptural ideas. During the time of this epistle, however, those heresies were in the formation stage. And by the time we get here to this particular chapter, and chapter 2, Paul is addressing the issue of salvation. Apparently, there were questions about salvation and this false doctrine of what we call works based religion. What this work based religion was, it says that you had to work in order to be saved, but my Bible tells me that we ought to work out our soul salvation with fear and trembling. And what Paul was talking about after being saved by believing in Christ, now we ought to show fruit. So, by the time we are at verse 8, Paul has already mentioned once, for by grace are you saved through faith. Amen. Paul starts out that first verse talking about the lives before Christ, and then he ends up talking about how, how now they are saved and they have been regenerated, they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So by the time we get here to chapter uh, 2, verse 8, uh, Paul is now driving home this point about salvation is only by grace through faith. Amen. Paul wrote, for by grace are you saved. Grace is the unmerited 
favor of God. This is not I am blessed and highly favored because the Bible only says that, that Mary received that title. You know, he walk around in church and we walk at Walmart and all these other places and people want to talk about, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored, but it is not that favor. It is an act of kindness beyond what is due. We do not deserve grace, but God has allowed for us to receive salvation by it. In other words, God, it is God's merciful kindness towards us as he extends his Holy Spirit upon our hearts as he turns us to his son. It keeps us. It strengthens us. It increases in us as we continue to put our hope in Christ. Amen. This shows the sufficiency of God's grace. You see, Grace is enough. It is adequate enough to change even the most coldest, stoniest hearts into a heart of flesh. One that honors and worships him. One that desires to be more like Christ. His grace is sufficient is what the Bible says. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. It is special grace. It is beneficial. It governs one's spiritual condition. Grace is a divine influence upon the heart as it reflects uh, by faith in the life of the believer or as he or she trusts in God. This is not common grace. Common grace says despite uh, my status with God, whether I'm going to heaven or whether I am blaspheming against him or totally against him, common grace is something that we all enjoy uh, because God blesses even fools and babes. It is grace. It is by this grace that we are saved. The word saved here in our text is derived from the Greek word soteria, which means to rescue. It is special saving grace that rescued us from the hell, death, and the grave. Somebody said, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. It was grace that brought us all the way. This is what Peter calls true grace. In 1 Peter 5 and 10, Peter calls God, and he says, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. H.B. Charles Jr. puts it like this, the grace that saves us is also the grace that sustains us. Grace is not just forgiveness of God that pardons us, but grace is also the faithfulness of God that protects us. Amen. This is why John Newton wrote the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Blind, but now I see. Amen. Faith is about putting our hope, our trust, our burdens, our griefs, our struggles, our pains, our trials, and even our fears in the power and might of our God. Amen. It's about putting our lives, both physical and spiritual, in the hands of God for our eternal security. Amen. Hebrews 11 tells us faith is the substance of things yet hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. It is like me going and sitting in this chair right here. I put my trust in the manufacturer. So when I sat down, I trusted that all the nuts and all the bolts were fastened. That's, it. That's the way it is with God. We should put 
put our trust in the creator of heaven and of earth to trust him with our whole life. Amen. Amen. To trust him with our situation, our circumstances. But you know how we are? We are Indian givers. We get on our knees and we pray to God and ask God to take over his burdens to allow us to go through them. Then we turn around and get up and take them on back with us. Faith is the avenue by which grace is imputed upon us, which produces faith. J.D. Besco wrote, saving faith is faith that not only knows and comprehends the fact about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also trusts in the person and work of Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Faith can only be achieved when you come to the conclusion that nothing or no one else could create the entire world in six days and never can get it. It only comes when we realize that no one else would give their only son for us. It happens when we conclude that nothing else will work. Oh, you know, you've tried Oprah, you've listened to Dr. Phil, You've seen your psychiatrist. You've talked to your girlfriend on the phone. you talked to your god friend on the phone. But there's no satisfaction until you get on your knees. There's no satisfaction until you trust God with your life. Look at Prince. Look at Michael Jackson. Look at all these people who had it all in our eyes and they still got Chasing a how that they could not obtain. You see, when we decide to put our hope and trust in God that cannot be seen by shape, form, or fashion, uh, we ultimately realize his existence and the things in which he has created. Paul talks about that in Romans 1, we can look around us and see what God has done. We can see God in the things that he created. You see, God had to exist outside of something in order for it to be created. He is the only creator. He is the only one who can save us. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Confucius, not Socrates or Pleiades. It is only by God. Amen. Only by God's grace. Amen. So true. Amen. This faith that we have, we must walk by faith and not by sight. We are redeemed by faith. We are justified by faith. And we are being sanctified by faith. And one day we will be glorified because of our faith. Somebody said faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Next, Paul adds here. He says, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Amen. Grace and faith are Gifts from God. They both come from Him. Grace is of God, or it is the grace of God. Titus 2 11 tells us, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Romans 3 24 reminds us that we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The gospel according to John reminds us that Christ came into the world, he dwelt among us, and he was full of grace and truth. H.B. Charles, Dr. H.B. Charles Jr. Uh, uh, adds this about grace. God is the ultimate source and contributor of grace. Not only is grace of God, faith is of God as well. For the Bible declares to us that God is the author and the finisher of our faith. You 
see, in order for there to truly be a gift, there has to be a giver and a receiver. The Bible declares to us that every good and perfect gift comes from God. No, God knows how to give good gifts. In fact, he gave the best gift of all. He gave his son, Jesus Christ. Christ for the world. Christ for the masses. Christ for the sinner. Christ for the homemonger. Christ for the adulterer. Christ for us all. Christ for those who have no hope. Christ for those who are down and out. Christ for those who are depressed. Christ for those who are hurting. Christ for those who see no way out. It is God's grace through faith that saves us. It is God's grace that will keep us. You must know Christ in the pardon of your sin. You must know him for yourself. You know, too many people, they try, they try to use someone else's testimony. They try their best to use somebody else's salvation to get in, but you got to sit on your own bottom. you got to know Christ for yourself. Right. You know, people try to pray the, uh, you come on, sister, you can, they try to pray this center prayer. Tell them that, you know, um, all you gotta do is just pray this sinner prayer and you'll be saved. You know, it's, we tell people that, that that God loves you and He has a plan for your life. But we need to tell people that the Bible says that we are enemies of God if we don't know Him. Yeah, I knew you'd be quiet. Because you heard Joel Osteen, you heard T.D. Jakes preach these types of things. But that is a damnable heresy from the gates of hell. God gave his son that we may know him. But if you reject him, you are his enemy. But see, the fact of the matter is he, he, he died for you. And the Bible says that he stands with an outstretched hand. He's knocking at the door of your heart saying, if you would only open up the door, he'll come in. He will suck with you. Take up residence in your life. He wants to build a relationship with you, but you must open up the door of your heart. Receive Christ into your life. For after all, that's the reason why he came. Said sacrifices and offerings. Thou wouldest not. And I could just imagine saying, Jesus saying, Daddy, prepare me a body. I'll go down and I'll redeem man back to you. Certainly, he was born of the Virgin Mary. You keep playing, sister. <laughs> He was born of the Virgin Mary in a stable weekend low. He, he went through life. He was lied on. He was talked about. He was told everything but a child of God.
carried his crucifixion cross as far as he could carry it. They now nails in his hands, rivets in his feet. They pissed him in the side. They put a crown of seven two thorns upon his head. But see, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I'm so glad today that when it was finished, Jesus Christ said, it is finished. He gave up the ghost. And then he died. Take 
little more concerned about your soul. Would you come to know Christ today? Glory is to you.